Hello everyone and welcome to Arcade Viking. Today is the fourth video in my Great Civilizations of Africa series. The subject of today's video is the Kingdom of the Lion King, the Mali Empire in medieval West Africa. So I'm sure many of you, when you hear the phrase West Africa, you think of West Africa as it is now, a region of Africa that contains the modern African countries of uh, so modern African countries such as the countries of Mauritania and Mali, Niger, uh, also Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia, Senegal, etc. And while this is not an incorrect way to think about the region of West Africa, it's also important to know that this is not the full picture. West Africa only took on its political borders and political landscape after a long series of events, processes, and catalysts. Uh, so in order to better understand how West Africa took on its political uh Board, you know, its political makeup and political borders, we need to go back a little bit in time to get a better look at the larger picture. Which leads us to our first section, the building blocks of the Mali Empire. So some of the, the earliest, or at least some of the earliest, if not the earliest, building blocks for civilizations that would arise in West Africa, uh, including Mauritania and Mali, is the Tichit culture. So the Tichit culture is a culture known for a variety of different of settlements and or arguably towns, if not cities, such as Akrajit, Daket El Trus, El Atrus, uh, and Dar Nima. All of which are uh, smack dab in the middle of territories that would eventually uh, become smack down uh, in the areas that eventually become the territories of large West African empires, such as the Empire of Ghana or the Ghana Empire. And we know quite a lot about the Tichit culture's um, settlement style, and uh, we have a lot of evidence for urbanization or what could be argued as urbanization in the Tichit culture based off of the archaeological evidence of these village sites such as Akrajit and Dar Nima, uh, etc. Then, a little bit later, we also begin to see the rise of the Jene Jeno culture uh, that was uh, located around the Jene uh, vicinity here uh, with archaeological evidence finding uh, quite a uh, a lot of archaeological excavations finding a lot of evidence for uh, roundhouses, square houses, etc., all made of cylindrical brick. Uh, and it's important to note that both the uh, Tichit culture and the Jenna culture have evidence for early agriculture, such as uh, the domestication of wild grasses and pearl millet, as well as the domestication of cattle. Uh, and at least by the uh, late Tichit culture and the uh, early Jene Geno culture, we begin to see iron production. Um, West Africa is a little bit unique from a lot of the world uh, because they don't have, they never had a Bronze Age. They had a uh, Iron Age because iron deposits were much more uh, abundant in that region than, say, copper or uh, other things. So... And I've already covered both those civilizations, the Jene Geno and the Dartichit culture, uh, in an earlier video on early complex civilizations of West Africa, which I will link in the iCard. Also in this region, uh, during the time of these cultures, the Dartichit culture and the Darnima culture, as well as before and after, were a variety of different, a variety of different uh, groups of people, uh, such as the Sonaki people, uh, the Berber speaking peoples, uh, as well as the uh, Malinke, also known as the Mandinka, or uh, the Mande peoples that you see here, all of which uh, intermix and intermarried together um, and really combined a lot of their cultures, uh, though of course their cultures were also unique in a lot of ways from each other as well. 
Now this leads us to our next building block for the Mali Empire, the Ghana Empire. So the Ghana Empire really took all of those groups together and eventually formed a the West, West Africa's first large scale empire, uh, being centered mainly in uh, southeast Mauritania and western Mali, as well as other parts, uh, other regions such as Burkina Faso um, and Senegal. And this was a very large empire. Uh, to put this in perspective, Mali alone, the country of Mali alone, uh, takes up at least five different U.S. states. Uh, and it's important to remember that United States states um, or provinces, if you want to call them that, are as big as European countries. So this, the Ghana Empire was in no way a small empire. And once it rose, the Ghana Empire very quickly took control of the Trans-Saharan trade routes, uh, mainly exporting gold, but exporting other things like uh, exporting and importing other things like salt and ceramics and glass and such. Um, and this trade route was mainly controlled and facilitated by, uh, of course, the Ghana Empire, but also uh, trade caravans that would traverse across the Saharan Desert to various different trade depots and cities. Uh, and it was also heavily uh, controlled and facilitated by the Berber tribes and Berber states that would eventually rise in the 700s and through um, thousands CE. However, eventually, uh, the Ghana Empire would fall to a variety of different factors. One, it would face repeated raids by Muslim empires, or maybe we think they did. We're not this not necessarily 100% for sure, but there is some evidence for it, uh, as well as the various different uh, tribal groups starting to gain independence from Ghana that would, be, would eventually lead Ghana to fracture into several different um several different offshoot kingdoms. Also a contributing factor to the weakening of the Ghana Empire was the rise in prominence of tribal groups such as the Mande tribes or Mende tribes to the southeast of the Ghana Empire. Though while the Ghana Empire did fracture into these smaller uh, kingdoms and successor states, so it, it is often argued that one of the su successor states uh, to the Ghana Kingdom or Ghana Empire, uh, Soso, was in fact still the uh, Kingdom of Ghana. Though, of course, that's up for debate. Though in my uh, video on the Ghana Empire, um, that's sort of the direction I went because it, it could be argued that Soso is still the Kingdom of Ghana, even if it has lost a good chunk of its territory. And I will link the uh, video to the Kingdom of Ghana uh, in the iCard. So as the Ghana Empire began to fracture into these various successor states, eventually the most powerful of these successor states and possibly the Ghana kingdom itself, depending on your perspective, Soso uh, would begin to conquer or reconquer, again, depending on your perspective, its rivals, including but not limited to uh, Tok Roar, uh, Dian Fu, and the southernmost of the successor kingdoms, Mali, who had already begun to have a closer relationship with the Mende tribes peoples because it is one of the uh, southernmost kingdoms and one of the closest kingdoms to the Monday tribes peoples. Which brings us to the meat of our to the meat of our video. The rise of the Mali Empire, the fall of what was left of the Ghana Empire, uh, all both of which were in con in connection to the rise of a certain individual by the name of Sungyata Keita. Um, Apologies if I butchered that. So, after the death of his father, Prince Sundiata Keita was exiled from the Mali court. He was a uh, prince of the small successor state of Ghana, Mali, uh, and he would be exiled to the distant parts of his kingdom by his half-brother, Donkar Ntomen. And again, apologies if I butchered that. 
at the same time that this is happening, that Sundiata Keita is being exiled from his court while his half-brother, Dunkar Toman, is seizing the throne, uh, the king of Soso, uh, Somoraru Kante, and again, apologies if I butchered that, would capitalize on his previous raids into Mali and Mande territory and would begin to conquer uh, Mali and the various Mande kingdoms or tribespeoples eventually forcing Dankara Toman to flee. All of this would happen right around uh, 1230 when uh, Sundia Takeda had been exiled uh, all the way through 1235 CE. After, after this happened, and after several years of exile, uh, delegations from the Mali court would send word to Sundia Takeda, uh, over here on the left, for aid. Sundiata would then gather an army uh, and march against the Kingdom of Soso, where he would defeat them at the Battle of Kirena, eventually founding the Mali Empire and becoming known as the, quote, Lion King. Uh, all this happened in 1235 CE. After establishing his Kingdom of Mali, uh, Sundiata Keita would then begin to uh, restructure the Mali government. First, he would declare himself as Munsa, uh, me uh, meaning emperor or king of kings, uh, with each allied chief being con uh, confirmed in his province, um, with the assembly then decreeing that the emperor must be chosen from Sundiata's line, and that princes must always choose their first wife among the Conde clan. Um, and as also in accordance with ancient tradition, the succession of uh, the throne would be fratrilineal, with the Mansa being the supreme judge and patriarch of his subjects. Sundiata would then uh, divide his allies into 16 clans of, quote, Quiver bearing freed nobles, with the five most loyal of his of those clans becoming known as the five guardians of faith. And then men practicing trades were divided into four clans or Nara Nini, including uh, shoemakers uh, and certain clans for smiths, among others. Uh, as well as Niger boatmen, uh, with the Niger boatmen uh, being rewarded for their contribution to the war when Sariata proclaimed them masters of the waters. He would also uh, establish rights and duties to each clan, uh, and a special measure would be dealt with the Soso, where their territory was declared property of the empire, and they were divided amongst the various clans and castes. Sundiata would then go on to make the city of Nianyi the capital of his new kingdom, uh, the plans of which are seen here. He would then uh, order his generals to continue to expand his empire, uh, where they would expand especially in the west, where they would reach the Gambia River and conquer the Tekror kingdom that you see here. Uh, which would enable Sundiata to rule over a realm that was larger than even the Ghana Empire at its apex, with his empire extending to around 1,000 miles uh, or uh, 1,600 kilograms east to west, with those borders being the events of the Senegal and Niger rivers. And here is a uh, depiction of the rise of the Mali Empire and its comparison to the Ghana Empire, and as you can see, it is indeed much larger than the Ghana Empire. And again, to put this into perspective, uh, as you can see in this map, the Ghana Empire takes up most of uh, Mali as well as a good chunk of the territory outside of the modern-day country of Mali. Uh, meaning that, again, if we look at this map right here of the modern-day country of Mali, which contains uh, several different United States, uh, U.S. states, uh, within it, with again, each of these states being as large as a European country, uh, this means that the Mali Empire was arguably one of the largest empires in the world at the time, um, and was by no means a small empire at all, especially in comparison to a lot of European kingdoms. 
After unifying the region under his new empire, Sun Yat would then go on to add the Wangara gold fields to his new empire, making them the southern border. And we can see that here and here. These are the major gold fields, and this would be Sun Yat's southern border. Sorry, the Mali Empire's southern border. <laughs> uh, then, after uh, taking control of the Wangara gold fields, uh, Sundiata would order his generals to march north, where they would take control of the northern commercial towns of uh, Walalata uh, and Arugost. And again, I apologies for probably butchering that, uh, where they would then become essentially the empire's northern border. Uh, much like the gold fields became the empire's southern border. Also during his reign, uh, much of the territory of West Africa to the south of the Mali Empire, located in the modern-day countries of Guinea and Senegal, would also be incorporated into the Mali Empire by Sundiata's generals. Leading to the Mali Empire's extent, looking something like this by the time of Sundiata's death, uh, with the exception of uh, Timbuktu and Gao being incorporated into the Mali Empire, that would actually come just a little bit later. Which leads us to our next section, the reign of the Keita dynasty. And this is a uh, family tree of the Keita dynasty. So, uh, after Sundiata Keita's death, um, his successors would gradually convert to Islam. And the reason I say his successors is because it's important to remember that Sundiata Keita was an adherent to traditional West African beliefs. However, his successors were not. In fact, fairly early on into the reign of the Keita dynasty, the Mansas of the Mal Empire would convert to Islam, starting with the successor and second Mansa of Mali, uh, the successor of Sundiata Keita and the, and the second Mansa of Mali, Wali Keita, who would actually go on to embark on a Hajj or a pilgrimage to Mecca during the reign of Mamluk Sultan of Egypt, Baibars. Uh, and here is a picture of a Hajj to, Maka, uh, to, to Mecca. And here is a statue of Bybars. Uh, and this, this tradition would actually continue uh, with the sixth Mansa of Mali, uh, Sakura, also embarking on a Hajj during the reign of Mamluk Sultan of Egypt, Al Nasir Muhammad. Uh, Sakura would also help um, really consolidate. Uh, the hold of the sorry the hold of the Mali Empire on the Trans-Saharan trade networks, uh, really allowing trade to flourish in and outside of the Mali Empire. Uh, and then, uh, just a few reigns later, the eighth uh, Mansa of Mali, Muhammad, would send out two separate naval expeditions under the premise of exploring the Atlantic Ocean, with Muhammad personally leading the second expedition, though he and the second expedition would never return. After this appearance, uh, disappearance of uh, Mansa Muhammad during his, six, his second expedition to explore the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Tanku Musa, who had been left in charge as sort of the regent of the empire by Mansa Muhammad, would be declared the ninth Mansa of the Mali Empire, taking on the title of Mansa Musa. Uh, Musa would then spend much of his early reign preparing for his own Hajj or pilgrimage to Mecca. Among these preparations would likely have been raids to capture and enslave people from neighboring lands, as Musa's entourage uh, will eventually include many thousands of enslaved people. Uh, there, it, there are loads of descriptions of his Hajj to Mecca and 
the descriptions just paint his um his entourage as being massive. And once these preparations are done, Mansa Musa would then embark on a pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, leading the aforementioned huge, one could argue, Herculean um, uh, entourage and caravan. Uh, but this wasn't just to uh, perform a hajj. To Mecca. Also, on his way to Mecca, Mansa Musa would conquer and incorporate cities such as Timbuktu and Gao into the Empire of Mali. Uh, and here is a uh, map of Mansa Musa's route to Mecca, uh, with particular interest being focused on Cairo. And the reason is, is because uh, a lot of evidence shows that, and contemporary sources also show that when, on his way through Cairo to Mecca, Mansa Musa brought so much gold with him. Remember, Ma the Empire of Mali is a major gold producing empire. Uh, so much gold from the Empire of Mali that he essentially caused, um, if not a full on depression, at least a recession to happen in the city of Cairo, with the exchange rate originally being uh, for gold and such being 25 to 1, but it fell to 3 or more. Uh, with the rate continuing to fall, uh, this started in 724 um, of the Muslim calendar, um, you know, again, roughly 1300, uh, 1324 uh, CE, uh, and it would continue to go down by first by two dinars uh sorry two dirhams and then by six dirhams and then by an unspecified amount uh, amount all in a single year so all in that same year it would this exchange rate for gold would just continue to plummet thanks to Mansa Musa coming through with these massive amounts of gold Though it should also be noted that this was not, while Mansa Musa most certainly exacerbated this issue, uh, as um, uh, as Warren Schultz here has shown, uh, there was already a the elite, if not a financial crisis, at least the beginnings of a of a financial crisis beginning to happen in Cairo. Uh, that again was just exacerbated and maybe started a little bit early because of Mansa Musa's uh, going through Cairo with all this gold. So it was not Mansa Musa's fault completely, but the amount of gold he brought with him certainly did not help. After his Hajj to Mecca, Mansa Musa would return to the Mali Empire with architects from Muslim Granada, uh, specifically the region of Andalusia, uh, and where he would use them to build a new palace and a great mosque in the city of Timbuktu, with the great mosque being here uh, and actually still existing to this day. He would also uh, rebuild and restaff the Sankori Madrasa or university uh, located in Timbuktu, with and he would restaff it with jurists, astronomers, and, math uh, and mathematicians. Uh, with the madrasa or university eventually becoming a center of learning uh, culture and culture drawing Muslims, uh, Muslim scholars from all around Africa and the Middle East to the city of Timbuktu. Uh, and eventually Mansa Musa would die somewhere around 1337 CE. There's still some debate on when he exactly died. Which brings me to the next section, the Golden Age of the Mali Kingdom. So, starting off, we're going to take a look at Timbuktu, which had become uh, one of the Mali Empire's centers of trade, culture, and Islam. Uh, in terms of trade, of course, uh, between the 13th and 14th centuries, caravans of up to 10,000 camels were passing through Timbuktu. And of course, they were a lot of them were carrying large amounts of gold produced in the region of West Africa, which would then be shipped up to great houses, uh, great Italian houses in cities such as Marseille, Genoa, Venice, and Florence, as well as other places, 
uh, all of which would help provide much of the wealth that fueled things like the Italian Renaissance. And then in terms of culture uh, and scholarship, um, by the 16th century, if not a little bit before the 16th century, Timbuktu, which had a population of around 100,000 people, uh, a quarter of that population, or 25,000 people, were either students or masters associated with uh, as one of the city's several great mosques. So again, in a population, a city with a population of 100,000 people, a full quarter of that population were scholars of some sort, or students of some sort. So 25,000 people out of 100,000 people. That's a pretty significant amount of the population. And of course, all of this is uh, backed up by the rise of literacy, as well as books and libraries in the city of Timbuktu. Uh, with uh, with um, Timbuktu housing as many as 150 or to 180 Quranic schools where basic reading and recitation of the Quran were taught. Um, also, the flow of books into Timbuktu naturally outpaced the number of books that were exported to the outside world. Uh, on top of that, books from the general body of Islamic knowledge were very common within the city of Timbuktu. Also, bookmaking was very prominent. In fact, it, it could be argued that it was so prominent that being a copyist was not a distinguished position. Uh, in fact, many of the students that existed within the city of Timbuktu, again, possibly as many as 25,000, uh, were also uh, taking part in the copying of texts uh, because it would familiarize them with the works of their teachers and those of other scholars. Uh, also, uh, li uh, libraries in Timbuktu uh, were constantly growing in number and had large amounts of books already within them. For example, the smallest library within Timbuktu uh, had at least 1,600 volumes. So a significant amount of books were, were even in the smallest of the libraries within Timbuktu. Though, of course, it's important to remember that, that reliable figures concerning the size and the scope of uh, libraries in Timbuktu are scarce. But that's if, if the smallest of these libraries still had 1,600 volumes of, of books within it, one can only imagine just how many the largest had. Though, it is also important to note, in comparison to the greater Muslim world, their, Timbuktu did not have any public libraries. Uh, whereas much, whereas the majority of the Muslim world had public libraries where anybody could access, and Tum Timbuktu, uh, there that didn't exist. In Timbuktu, all of these libraries tended to be private libraries of, um, you know, you know, essentially the private collections of individual scholars or families. Uh, and here's just a little more. Um, explanation of that. Uh, and here are some of those books that would be, that were created and possibly imported into the city of Timbuktu that you can see here and here. Now we're going to the next part of the golden age of the Mali Empire, trade. So as I've alluded to a couple of times earlier in the video, uh, the Mali Empire very quickly seized control of, uh, or seized a controlling part of the Trans-Saharan trade routes, uh, as seen here. And here, with the main exports of the Mali Empire being gold, copper, and salt, while the Mali Empire would then import goods from outside uh in their kingdom from the uh, Muslim world as well as the Christian world and maybe as distant as China, though of course that's highly up for the bait, uh, but these trade goods that they would import would be things like glass objects like you see here, or oil lamps, or silk fabrics as seen here.
Also, the existing trade networks that were maintained and controlled by uh, kingdoms like the Mali Empire would allow for foreign exploratory expeditions such as Ibn Battuta's third voyage into West Africa. Now we need to look at the art of the Mali Empire during its golden age. So the Mali Empire is very well known for its, uh, in terms of art, for its very beautiful and, intric and intricately designed sculptures, as you see, as seen here, uh, like statues of a bearded figure or statues of a mother and their child, um, statues of serpents, uh, made, coiled serpents made out of terracotta, uh, so, and uh, statues of kneeling figures. And then, uh, in the same vein, this leads us to the army of the and weapons of the Mali Empire during its golden age. So the Mali Empire would continue to maintain a semi-professional full-time army in order to defend its borders. Uh, the entire nation in event of war would be mobilized, with each clan being obligated to provide a quota of fighting age men. These men would have to be of the Horon or Freeman caste. Uh, again, apologies for possibly butchering that. Um, and would be expected to appear with their own weapons. Uh, with the Mali Empire's army peaking at around 100,000 men, with at least 10,000 of that number being made up of cavalry, uh, similar to what you see here. And we know a lot of, we know that. A, that a significant amount of the Mali Empire's uh, army consisted of cavalry because we can actually, going back to the art, which is why I said in that same vein, we actually go back to the art of the Mali Empire and find various different figurines and statuettes of Mali horsemen, as seen here and here. And when it comes to weapons used by the military of the Mali Empire, uh, cavalry of the Mali Empire were, one, oftentimes mounted archers. They did use bows, like seen here, uh, but they would wear things like, uh, the cavalry would wear things like gambeson and chainmail, very similar to European um, chainmail or mail. Um, infantrymen and cavalrymen would use spears, similar to this one here, as well as they would wield swords similar to this. And then when it comes to shields, they would wear either uh, some form of bark or reed shield covered in leather or covered in metal, covered in iron. Which leads us to our next section, the decline and fall of the Mali Empire. So starting off, even during the empire's golden age, uh, the Empire of Mali's economy would begin to suffer heavily, uh, especially after several months, would nearly bankrupt the treasury of the Empire of Mali, of the Kingdom of Mali. And all of this would be further exasperated by the beginning of the fragmentation of the Mali Empire itself. In fact, again, even during the Mali Empire's Golden Age, the Mali Empire was already beginning to break apart, starting specifically after the death of Mansa Musa himself. Whereas after his death, a kingdom that um, the Mansas such as Musa and Sundi Adikeda had conquered, Songhai, would secede from and break away from the Mali Empire around 1340 CE. At the same time, as and also a little bit before, uh, the Masi horsemen to the southeast of the kingdom of Mali, of the Empire of Mali, would begin to ra uh, raid into uh, Timbuktu and other surrounding cities within the Mali Empire. And not only that, just 20 years after the secession of of the Kingdom of Songhai in 1340 CE, other kingdoms also would break away as well, such as the Wolof inhabitants of the Jolof Kingdom, who would unite under their own emperor and form the Jolof Empire, uh, 
during a succession crisis that would follow the death of Suleiman, the 11th Mansa of Mali. Uh, furthermore, in 1374, Mali's uh, CE, Mali's eastern provinces, would begin to enter into open rebellion before being put down by uh, Sandaki, or High Counselor and de facto ruler of the Mali Empire, Mari Jata. Uh, though the Mali Empire would be unable to take the city of Tad Mecca, uh, or Tad Mecca, east of Gao in a siege, um, which all of which would make the overall success of the campaign mixed at best. Furthermore, the Masis would continue to conduct more raids on the weakened Mali Empire, especially in 1400 CE. Not only that, uh, Tuareg nomads would begin to would, would launch a major invasion from the north, capturing the cities of Timbuktu, Arwan, and Walata in 1433 CE. And then, on top of all of that that I just mentioned, the important city-state of Jene would gain its independence from, of, of the Empire of Mali, uh, leading the Mali Empire to lose almost all access to the Saharan trade routes. Without these trade routes, Mali cannot get uh, enough horses to take the centers back, or as well as cannot preserve its own precarious position which forces the Mali Empire to look south for their own economic security. All of this happened in 1439 CE. Which now leads us to our next section, the Mali Empire on the defensive. So, uh, starting in 1444 CE, Portuguese caravels uh, would begin to launch slave raids on the coastal inhabitants of West Africa, actually catching the Malian vassal territories off guard. And here is a Portuguese caravel, and here is a uh, slave caravan led by the Portuguese. However, despite these raids, the Mali Empire would actually be able to successfully counter the Portuguese raids using fast, shallow drop watercraft meant for rivers and things like that in coastal areas, uh, with the Mali M army specifically inflicting a series of defeats against the Portuguese due to the Mali army's uh, expert war archers who used poison arrows. All of this would eventually actually lead the Portuguese to sue for peace in 1456 CE. And here is a uh, picture of the Mali army as it would have been uh, both during its golden age and at the time of the Portuguese raids. However, despite their victories against the Portuguese slave raids, uh, the Mali Empire would begin to weaken and suffer heavily due to the rise of the Songhai Empire. Remember, the Songhai Kingdom had broken off from the Mali Empire around 1440 C, yeah, around 1340 CE, uh, but by this point in time, but in the time period between 1468 and 1530 CE, not only had the Songhai Empire grown to be much larger than the Mali Empire, it also began to exert its influence over the Mali Empire and other regional powers such as the Masi horsemen. All of this together would eventually lead to the Mali Empire being too weak to fight back against foreign invasion. Uh, specifically in 1599 CE, when the Saudi Sultanate of, Mo of Morocco would invade deep into West African territory and would defeat the Mali Empire at the Battle of Jene in, again, 1599 CE. With that, uh, despite this defeat, the Mali Empire would be able to live on for about another 10 years, another decade. However, uh, the last Mansa of the Mali Empire, Masa, uh, Mansa Mahmud Keita IV, would die 
uh, an oral tradition states that he did have three sons who could, in theory, succeed him. However, they would fight over the Mali Empire, leading to no single Keita ruling over the Mali Empire. In fact, no single Keita would ever rule over the Mali Empire again after the death of Mahmud Keita. Uh, all of this together would eventually result in the collapse of the Mali Empire by 1625 CE, as you can see here. Okay, so now that we have taken a look at the Mali Empire, uh, the, the building blocks of the Mali Empire, the rise of the Mali Empire, its golden age, its fall, uh, its decline and eventual fall, now it is time to look at its legacy. So for one thing, uh, while the Mali Empire did eventually fall, its expansion would allow for the spread of Monday culture and Monday languages from the mouth of the Gambia River to what is now Burkina Faso, and particularly through the Di particularly through Diula traders from the Niger Loop to the trading centers on the south coast. Also, a particular one that is is to be fair for debate, but a particularly interesting legacy of the Mali Empire is the movie The Lion King. Now, everyone watching, I want you to bear with me a little bit, but there are several scholars of West Africa uh, who specialize in West African history who have pointed out, and even pointed it out to, the, uh, to Disney itself, that the movie The Lion King bears a very striking, the plot of the movie The Lion King specifically, bears a very striking resemblance to the plot of the Epic of Sundiata Keita, also known as the Lion King of Mali. But Dane, I hear you asking, Disney has taught, has said that uh, the Lion King is based off of uh, Hamlet and other uh, and other um, uh, Renaissance plays, other Shakespearean plays, uh, like again Hamlet. Is it though? Is what I would ask. Yes, in the movie. Uh, in the Lion King movie, yes, uh, Simba is visited by the ghost of his father, much like Hamlet is visited by the ghost of visited by the ghost of his father in the play Hamlet. But really, the, and, and yes, Simba's father is murdered, and you know that's what prompt, eventually prompts Simba's father to appear to him as a ghost. But really, that's where the uh, Similarities stop. So, for one thing, uh, in The Lion King, Simba, when his father is murdered, uh, his father is murdered in front of his eyes, and he is a young boy. And then he is promptly forced to run away into exile. In Hamlet, <laughs> it begins with Hamlet already being an adult, his father already having died, and Hamlet not going into exile. So, you know, and, and also Hamlet's father shows up to him in ghost form pretty much immediately in the play. So doesn't really match up. But you can also be like, well, dang, you know, it doesn't have to match up one to one to be to to not be uh, for like for the Lion King not to be based off of Hamlet. Fair. So I will describe to you a story. So. A young prince's father is murdered and dies, prompting the eventually prompting the young prince to be sent off in exile by another individual so that they can become king. That king then rules as a tyrant, uh, prompting eventually the prince to return with a large army to overthrow the tyrannical king upon which he then takes his rightful place at the throne and then promptly leads his kingdom into a golden age. Now, does that sound like the plot of Hamlet? <laughs> no. Hamlet ends with, is famously ends with basically everyone who matters dying, including Hamlet. Hamlet does not take the throne, he does not lead the kingdom into a new golden age, or anything like that. 
However, all of that that I just described definitely fits with the plot of the Epic of Symbiotic Keta. Furthermore, Symbiotic Keta is known as the Lion King, and the Disney movie is known as the Lion King. Now, I'm not denying that the Lion King has some Hamlet in it. I mean, the ghost thing, it, you know, the showing up of the of Simba's father in ghost form definitely is, is from Hamlet. But to say that it is completely based off of Hamlet, um, it, it, does, it just just to me doesn't match up. And, and in a lot of other scholars who specialize in West African history agree. Now, of course, Disney has um, denied this uh, heavily, but given Disney's history with racism, uh, especially involving Walt Disney uh, and his family, we can't necessarily count them as reliable sources. So. Uh, now, with that, we're going to go leads us into our last section. Where are the Mande people today? Well, the Mande people in West Africa are still alive and well, and despite European colonization and conquest by uh, kingdoms such as the Saudi Sultanate of Morocco, have been able to keep their culture alive and well, as you see here in this picture. So, with that, that leads us to the end of our video. Uh, we've covered one of West Africa's most powerful and arguably West Africa's most well-known empire. Um, I hope you all enjoyed learning about this empire and its golden age and its legacies. Uh, if you would like to see me cover uh, any of the subjects I mentioned in the video in greater detail in other videos, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section. And I hope you all enjoyed the video and remember to like, share and subscribe. And I hope you all have a good day.